Across centuries, the House of Rothschild have wielded unprecedented dominance, blending familial solidarity and relentless profit-seeking. From modest roots, they rise to influence international finance, wars and politics, and become the most formidable banking dynasty of their age. The Rothschild banking dynasty has an unlikely origin, an 18th century ghetto in Frankfurt, Germany. Like many of his time, Meyer Amschil Roth's dot child can't own land or farms due to his race. So he follows his family's path and becomes a textile trader. The ghetto was not very encouraging. Shops spilled heaps of secondhand clothes and soiled household goods into the alley. Frankfurt youths are barred from farming, from handicrafts, even from dealing in nobler goods such as weapons, silk or fresh fruit. Mayor Roth's child quickly grows discontented with trading textiles and becomes eager to explore other ventures, ones that offer higher profit margins. He soon discovers that trading gold coins and antiques could be much more lucrative. Meyer Roth's child quickly establishes himself as a shrewd trader and uncovers a brilliant strategy known today as front-running. He worked as a court agent, much like today's stockbrokers. His main client was Prince William of Hesse Castle. Whenever William wanted to purchase gold coins, he would ask Meyer Roth's dot child to obtain them from the market. What Roth's child did was this. He would first buy the coins using borrowed money, then sell them to Prince William, effectively acting as both the buyer and the seller. This practice is known as front-running in modern terms. In doing so, he profited twice once from the 8% commission fee and also from front-running Prince William. By 1782, Mayor Roth's child has amassed a colossal fortune and earns the position as the investment manager for Prince William's vast wealth. But for Mayor Roth's child, it's just the beginning. To truly create a strong footing in the world of finance, he must evolve into a bank. Often, when traders and court agents accumulated significant wealth through their financial dealings, they sought greater recognition and respectability. Transitioning into banking was a way to gain legitimacy and credibility. Getting into banking proves genius for Meyer. By the close of the 1700s, he's the richest man in Frankfurt. But still, for Meyer Roth's dot child, it isn't enough. He envisions a legacy beyond wealth, a family dynasty that stands the test of time, outlasting nations and empires. To me, it's always what's next. And I think that's what drives most very successful people. It's never about the money. I mean, that's a way of keeping score. It's about achievement and it's about winning a game and it's about upping the ante. To do that, he knows he needs to think bigger than just Frankfurt or even Prussia. To expand, he dispatches four of his five sons to the great capitals of Europe, Vienna, Naples, Paris, and the jewel of the empire, London. In the early 1800s, Great Britain stands as a global superpower with a vast empire across continents. With the British Royal Navy unmatched, the seas are theirs. The Industrial Revolution is transforming the economy, making Britain an industrial and manufacturing powerhouse. The financial sector centered in London is robust. With the establishment of the Bank of England in 1694, London becomes a global financial center. Meyer Roth's dot child has built a thriving banking business in Frankfurt, but he realizes to sustain the long-term prosperity of the family, he needs to expand to different major cities in Europe, including sending his third son to London, England. His name is Nathan Roth's dot child. For Nathan Roth's dot child, the pressure is immense. He feels compelled to demonstrate to his father that he is equally capable of upholding the family legacy. Nathan was a fiercely ambitious and competitive man, as quick to take offense as to give it in his business dealings. With $20,000, his father gave him as investment. Nathan plans to maximize it as quickly as possible by any means necessary. In the early 1800s, the London textile industry saw significant growth. This industry was marked by many small-scale workshops and factories that produce many different types of textiles from cotton to silk. Nathan sees an opportunity to capitalize on this growth while maximizing profits, he managed to create three sources of profits from the textile industry. According to his own account, Nathan was successful in his early years. I soon found that there were three profits, the raw material, the dyeing, and the manufacturing. 
I said to the manufacturer, I will supply you with material and dye, and you will supply me with manufactured goods. So I got three profits instead of one, and I could sell goods cheaper than anybody. In a short time, I made my $20,000 into $60,000. To ensure consistent revenue, Nathan also ventures into the lucrative realm of smuggling textiles and precious metals. He became, in a word, a smuggler. By 1808, Nathan had earned a reputation as a man who had, thanks to his superior management, judgment, foresight, and above all, his unquenchable energy, won the respect of all his fellow traders. Nathan was fiercely loyal to his family and regarded his father as a hero. The love and admiration he felt for him were so strong that they bordered on the obsessive. Nathan once wrote, I feel it is almost a crime to talk of his failings. He never had any. He never can have any. He must always be an object of admiration and envy to the world. In him is a rare assemblage of the most exalted virtues. In 1811, Nathan Roth's child receives a letter from his father. The letter was sent by Carrier Pigeon and contained an urgent message. Buy British government bonds. Do not sell. The Roths. Child family had been following the events of the Napoleonic Wars very closely. They knew that the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo would have a significant impact on the financial markets. Nathan acted swiftly on his father's instructions. He started buying up all the British government bonds he could find on the London Stock Exchange. Other traders took note of his actions and assumed that Nathan had received news of a British defeat. Panic ensued and the price of British government bonds plummeted. Nathan then used his considerable wealth to purchase a vast quantity of these bonds at rock-bottom prices. When news of the British victory reached London, the price of government bonds soared. Nathan Roth's our child sold his bonds at a massive profit, earning the Roth's our child family a fortune. With his cunning maneuver, Nathan Roth's our child secured the financial future of his family for generations to come. The Roth's dot Childs were now the wealthiest family in the world, and their influence extended to every corner of the globe. Nathan once said, I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire, and I control the British money supply. The Roths. Childs had indeed become the puppet masters of the world, pulling the strings of kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers, but despite their immense wealth and power, the Roths' childs remained a secretive and enigmatic family, shrouded in mystery and intrigue. They were the ultimate insiders, privy to the inner workings of governments and financial institutions, yet they operated in the shadows, away from the prying eyes of the public. The Roths' child dynasty has endured for over two centuries, weathering wars, revolutions and economic crises. Their influence remains as strong as ever, their wealth vast beyond imagination. But as with all great dynasties, there are whispers of decline, rumors of internal strife and external threats. Will the Roths dot childs continue to reign supreme? Or will they finally be toppled from their perch atop the world's financial hierarchy? Only time will tell. But one thing is for certain, the name Roths child will forever be synonymous with power wealth and influence.